Welcome to Extreme Makeover, NGSS Edition. Today's episode 2, we look at the Crater Lab. When I was a high school teacher, uh, I used to teach a lab where I had students drop marbles into a pan of flour and measure craters, and I gave them very detailed instructions, step by step, exactly how high to hold that marble, when to drop it, where to drop it. All those things were spelled out perfectly. So today we look at how do we turn that activity into an integrated NGSS activity. When we approach this the way that the California Framework Preferred Integrated Model Grade 8 Instructional Segment 1 does, we begin the lesson completely different than what I did when I was teaching just earth science. I start by telling my students that my son is in second grade right now and he's been learning about dinosaurs. And he's learned that all these different crazy looking animals have gone extinct. And so he came one, home one afternoon and asked, were there more different types of animals 120 million years ago than there are today? Well, how do we figure out an answer to that question? My students can usually come up with something about fossils. They know that those are important. So let's take a look at how do fossils help us answer this question. We know that when sediments settle out and form rock layers, there are sometimes fossils that get uh, recorded within those layers. So what we can do is we can look for rock layers that formed all around the world at about the same time. We can start off in one place and find a layer and figure out that it's 120 million years old and basically count the number of different types of animals that we see, the number of species in there. And here we go, we have one, our first fossil. We can go to a different spot on Earth and see that there's layers. Oh, there's a layer that's 120 million years old right there. And we can count up. We found two more species in that. And over here, here's another layer, 120 million years old. We found more species and more species over in China and more down in Australia and all these different layers here until we end up having a collection of the total number of species that formed in all the different layers that we found all over the world at 120 million years ago. And we succeeded at doing that for 120 million years in, say, this layer. Well, we know that if we go up, newer layers have been deposited layer on top of layer on top of layer. On, and so if we want to find rocks from 110 million years ago, we might go up a little bit higher. And then do the same thing, count the number of species. And then for 100 million years, we're going to go up higher still. And we can start doing that. And we can start tallying up the number of species and putting them on a graph. And scientists have done this for all the rock layers that span the history of life on Earth. And they get a graph that looks like this. On the horizontal axis, we have time in millions of years ago from a very long time ago here at the beginning all the way up to today on the right side. The vertical axis tells us about the number of types of genera, which is actually just a more general thing than, than our species. It's the types of organisms. So we start from only having a very little variety uh, at the beginning of this graph, all the way up to having many, many different types of organisms. And you can see that things go up and down. What does it mean for the number of types of organisms to go down? Well, that means that those species no longer exist on Earth, which means that they went extinct. And looking at our graph, can we answer our original question, were there more types of animals 120 million years ago compared to today? Well, yeah, we can. We can see that pretty clearly on the graph. But we also start seeing a lot of other things now that we have such a rich data set. And what I do now is I ask my students, what new questions do you have when you look at these data? And I want them to write down as many new questions as they can so that we can put them on our wall of wonder. Many of my students fixate on a couple different points. This spot right here where all of a sudden the number of genera drops, and again here, and they ask, why does it do that? And we can help them improve that question from a why question, which is a little bit vague, to a what caused the number of species to go down suddenly? And now that we have that question as one of our main questions, in addition to many other questions uh, that our students have that we're going to keep posted on our wall of wonders so we can return to them, we're going to start looking at this particular uh, drop here at about 65 million years ago, which is when the dinosaurs went out. And many of our students come into class knowing a little bit about how the dinosaurs uh, died off, and they might have some prior knowledge. Uh, that may or may not help them as we look at the evidence about what caused this extinction event here. And we're going to start with a story uh, and a claim. 
One claim that scientists have made is that dinosaurs died off because of massive volcanic activity. And this picture is a little bit uh, misleading. Let me show you exactly what they're talking about. Uh, there exists a, a place on Earth where some rocks formed around that time, about, 600, about 65 million years ago, uh, where there were layer on top of layer of lava flows literally 2,000 meters, a mile and a quarter thick of lava flows. And this is an area in India, and if I superimpose that on California, you can see that it takes up about a large fraction of California's area. So imagine enough lava to cover the entire state of California, one mile thick in lava flows. And all of that came out relatively suddenly. And so you can imagine with all these volcanoes erupting in that spot, massive volcanic activity, put a lot of ash in the air, and that started to block out the sun, causing plants to die, which caused the ecosystem to collapse. And so this is a claim that dinosaurs died off because of this process here. Is it right? Well, we need to gather evidence for that. And what I've done is I've got a, set, a series of 12 cards that I cut out that have different pieces of evidence that relate to this problem. And I have the students look through those and read through those, and then in groups, they're going to place those cards into one of three columns. Either that piece of data supports the claim, it contradicts the claim, or it doesn't really provide any direct evidence at all. It might be factually true, but it's not relevant to this particular problem. So for example, if we're looking at the claim about what killed the dinosaurs, if I have a piece of evidence card that there are 12 inches in one foot, w w that doesn't really help us much at all, so we'll put that right here in the middle category. So we give our students some time to look through those and sort them along, and I want you to pause the video and go back and look at those cards and sort each of them for yourself. Then, when you come back, I have a lot of students that put this one here, that rocks that date from 65 million years ago contain quartz crystals that have been changed under sudden high heat and pressure. These have only been discovered in two places on Earth today, nuclear test sites or meteor or asteroid impacts. And they say that that contradicts the claim that volcanoes caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And this gives me a chance to really talk about what it means to contradict a claim. Now, in science, it's really hard to prove things correct, but we can gather evidence that helps really disprove things. And so when we say something contradicts a claim, that says that that claim is impossible. That means that we have evidence that that simply could not happen. And what this piece of information here, what this supports is this supports an alternate claim, a claim that meteor or asteroid impact craters might have caused this extinction. That's different than saying that the claim about volcanoes is impossible. And so we make this distinction that, that supporting one claim is not the same as contradicting another claim. And we're going to see why that's important in just a few minutes here. So I would actually put this one here in the doesn't provide direct evidence. And once you start revisiting your uh, columns that you've put things in, you might find that there are very few pieces of evidence that and probably none that actually contradict the original claim. We have a lot of evidence that may or may not help support things uh, because it's related to another claim. And that other claim, p students are starting to get the idea, is about this. Dinosaurs died off because of a massive impact. Something came and crashed into the earth. Now, uh, the evidence for this here uh, is that off of the coast of Mexico, there's a, a large crater, and this crater, if I put that on California, imagine a hole the size of Los Angeles, but about 10 miles deep. And this process is very similar to the one that we saw for the volcano claim. We have a massive impact. That throws up dust into the air, which blocks out the sun, causes our plants to die, and our ecosystem to collapse. So what we do now is we want to look at those same evidence cards that we had. We're going to get a second set of them and sort them again, this time trying to see do those evidence cards support or contradict this claim that dinosaurs died off because of an impact. So now we're going to have two sets of cards on two templates side by side, and we're going to be able to look at them, and we're going to be able to, to weigh which one is supported more strongly by the evidence. I 
think when you find that, when you look at these cards, uh, you will see that the evidence supports both of these claims kind of equally. There's not a lot of uh, evidence to contradict either one of the claims. Maybe you can find a few things, in particular uh, uh, if you pay attention to uh, claims about the timing of the event. We now have two claims that are seemingly equally supported, if you just count up the number of cards. But that's not how scientists do it. We don't just count pieces of evidence. We look at the evidence and think, which one of these is the most compelling, the thing that convinces us the most, that seems like it's the strongest piece of evidence? Uh, and so I want you to go through those evidence cards and try and see if you can figure out if there's any particular pieces of evidence that are weaker or stronger than others and try and sort those out. Our students, of course, want to know which claim is correct. What did cause the dinosaurs to become extinct? And it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than that. With our available evidence, we can't distinguish between these two causes. But this also gives us the opportunity to talk about the cross-cutting concept of cause and effect a little bit more explicitly with our students. And I'm going to do that here with you as teachers, focusing in on some resources that are available to you in California Framework Appendix 1, which has the three-dimensional progressions. And this shows how each part of the NGSS evolves from when early elementary all the way up through high school as things get more and more complicated. The, the appendix has uh, items for every part of each of the three dimensions. So for example, cross-cutting concept 2, cause and effect, has this entry. And I want to draw your attention to the middle school section of this here. And I told you how we're trying to start illustrating how cause and effect relationships are more complicated. In fact, we want to make sure that in middle school our students understand that phenomena may have more than one cause. In the case of the dinosaur extinction, it's possible that both that meteor In the case of our dinosaur extinction, it's possible that both the impact and the volcanism caused dust and ash to be thrown up into the air that blocked the sun that caused the plants to die and ecosystems to collapse. So maybe both of those things contribute. And just to add an even more exciting level of complexity on, there even is a mechanism where seismic shock waves from that crater could actually trigger volcanism on the opposite side of the globe where the Deccan traps are. And so maybe this is a possibility as well. We certainly have that possibility that an impact helped cause the extinction of the dinosaurs. So the question is, how big an impact would you need to cause a crater that large? And, and are there other objects out there in space that could, be, that could be the source of another impact that could hit us again? Well, in order to answer this question, this is where we start getting into the crater lab. What I do is I distribute to my students a bunch of different balls and tell them, plan what you want to investigate. And you can see within these here, we've got a whole bunch of balls that have the same diameter but uh, very different masses. Uh, and another group of balls with this, uh, approximately the same diameter and different masses and a third group. And so students can start playing around and investigating all sorts of different things. And in this case, I'm really going after that uh, SEP3 planning and conducting investigations where they're really planning what they want to investigate. And that means that not all of my student groups are going to be pl are going to be investigating the same thing. These are eighth graders and then we're hoping that they're going to start being able to really drive their own investigative questions at this point. What our students end up doing is they end up taking these objects and dropping them down into a pan of either sand or flour. Uh, I like to do this in a sandbox at a K-8 school where I can go and drop things there and not have to clean up afterwards. And they drop the objects and then they measure the size of the impact crater and try and make sense of if they can figure out patterns and what affects the size of the impact. Now I want to take this opportunity to plug something, an idea that I have that when we're talking about motion here at the middle school level, especially in collisions that go by so fast, it's really helpful to mo analyze the motion using video. And you can really see things and play it over and over again and watch things. And not just that, we can actually start using our videos to make much more accurate measurements. For example, in this particular video, we can watch the marble fall and then as it goes, we can record where it is in two different frames, figure out on the meter stick how many meters that is, and we know that uh, video frames tend to be about 1 30th of a second, so you can take a distance divided by a time and you can actually figure out how fast that marble is moving right before it impacts things. 
and there are software packages to help with this. Uh, a really nice one is the Vernier Video Physics package. If you happen to have an iPad school, this $5 fee is actually really well worth it. But if you are cheap or don't have access to the iPads, uh, the program Tracker is free for uh, desktop computers. The only thing is you need to uh, take your pictures on another computer and then record them and, and upload them to your computer and work from there. But these allow us to get much higher quality data and also do math connections as well. In my classroom, I have a couple different teams doing different things. I have one team that's looking at how much speed matters, and so they took the marbles and they dropped them at different heights and figured out how fast they were going from each height, uh, and then measured the crater diameter. They used the same ball every time. A different group thought they wanted to know how much the mass mattered. Did it make a difference? So they took balls with the same diameter, the same size, and dropped them all from the same height and checked to see how much the mass affected the crater diameter. And when we see these, we ask our students to invoke cross-cutting concept number one, patterns and trends. Trends are an important part of cross-cutting concept number one. And you can see that we can start adding trend lines here and saying, if the speed is faster, can you predict how fast or how big the crater diameter is going to be? And you can actually uh, implement that and actually have your students do that. Give them another ball that's the same size that you hadn't given them before and have them actually ca test their prediction. Another thing to notice about this is that if you a look at this particular curve, this one here, when you're looking at the speed, this line it doesn't quite do justice to things. If we take off the lines here, I feel like this line might have a little bit of a curve to it, more like this. And look at how much of a difference that makes when you get to higher speeds in your predictions. And this allows us the opportunity to really think about the relationship between speed and the crater impact is a little bit different than the relationship between mass and the crater impact. And those of you that know the equation for kinetic energy know what's going on here, which allows us to get into that whole concept of what kinetic energy is. In fact, the middle school performance expectation that we're trying to meet here is to construct and interpret graphical displays of data to describe the relationship of kinetic energy to the mass of an object and the speed of an object. And that's what we just did. We were looking at graphs uh, showing the mass of the object and the speed, and instead of measuring kinetic energy itself, we were measuring the impact crater. And that gives us a chance to discuss what does it mean to have energy, and how does that energy get transferred to the ground and cause that impact crater. Another thing videos allow us to do is they really allow us to pause and look in detail at what's actually happening during the impact and ask new questions. Even though we are able to answer our question about crater size, we now start coming up with more specific questions like, how does the mass of the debris compare to the mass of the original object? Is there more stuff that's thrown out than the, that original object? And does the stuff fly out faster than the object drops or slower? And why is that? And so you students can actually start developing ways to ask those questions and then answer them. You can imagine putting out a piece of paper across here with a little hole in it and capturing all of the spray of that uh, ejecta and then putting it on a scale and measuring it. You can also use the video program to figure out does the debris fly out faster or slower. You can actually track it and see how much faster or slower. And this allows us to start looking at energy transfer during collisions. The California framework gives us a tool to help students conceptualize energy transfer and interactions. These are called energy source receiver diagrams. And let me walk you through how these work. What you do is you have some sort of a system where there's objects that are possibly interacting. And in this case, we have a fast moving skateboarder and a person who's sitting stationary and reading a book and they're about to collide. During the collision, we can create a model to show how energy flows. We know that we have this skateboarding person who's going to obviously come to a stop, which means they're going to decrease in kinetic energy. That poor person who's reading the book is going to get crashed into. Energy is going to transfer to them, and that's going to cause them to start moving. And that means they're going to increase in kinetic energy. And there's this idea that these two must be balanced. Whatever energy is decreased on the left side needs to be transferred to an increase in energy on the right side. 
And these diagrams work for more complicated situations. So here's an example of a roller coaster, uh, and we have a, a little person in a car going down the hill, and that person is, as they go down, obviously they're speeding up, which is getting more and more exciting. They're saying, wee! Well, we need to track back and figure out where does that energy come from. And we look at this system, and we see that, well, the other th objects in the system, really the main object, is the roller coaster itself. And it's going to decrease in some form of energy. What type? Well, it's going downhill, so that means it decreases in gravitational potential energy. Another example is when I take a, my students and I have a, a Ziploc bag and I have mix up a bunch of chemicals inside and that bag heats up. So again, we'll start with the right side here and we know that that bag heated up and increased in thermal energy. Where did that energy come from? We have to track it back and we're again stuck with this situation where this system, it's a sealed bag. The only thing that we have inside that system is the chemicals inside that bag. So we know that they must decrease in some sort of energy and what type? Well, this allows us to basically show the existence of chemical potential energy. So these diagrams can be very useful uh, and we can use them throughout the eighth grade as we look at different energy transfers during interactions uh, and different energy conversion processes like the chemical potential energy example here. At this point in the instructional segment, our students might go off and do some other things that are a little bit unrelated to our original question about life sciences. Uh, and they might go and look at energy transfer during collisions uh, of toy cars. They might do an engineering challenge where they're trying to design something that's going to minimize the, the uh, damage during a, a collision, like an egg droppings challenge. Um, and they'll go off and do those for a while so they get a much richer understanding of energy transfer. And then they're ready to return back to the original question of how big an impact would you need to cause a crater this large. Well, there are some great online simulators where students can make little sliders to drag the size of their projectile, the density of it, change the angle at which it hits, change the speed, uh, and also change the, the material that it crashes into, and, and then run the simulator and figure out how big a crater they would form. Uh, and you can see that there's vi different visualizations both on a map uh, where you can see where your school is and how much of your school would be consumed or the city around your school. There's a picture here where the Empire State Building and you can see how much bigger than the Empire State Building this crater is and really get a sense of this and start thinking about what would happen if one of these uh, impacts happened again today. Within phenomenon driven instruction it's often a good idea to return to our anchoring phenomena at the end of an instructional segment as well then revisit it and try and see do we see it with new eyes now. Now that we have a better idea about these claims about how these physical interactions can eventually cause ecosystems to collapse, we can ask questions about how things are impacting the biosphere. A lot of those questions we won't get to answer or address until later in the, in the course, but we can still look at them and ask. We can also use this opportunity to transition to instructional segment two, which addresses gravity among other things, and let me show you how we do that. Whenever we have a really rich data set, we want to start looking at it through different lenses, including the lens of, say, cross-cutting concept one, patterns. And a question that we can ask related to patterns is, do you notice a periodicity, something that happens over and over and over again with a regular cycle? And when scientists have looked at this, they have indeed noticed a regular periodic pattern and started to ask questions about what's causing that. And one claim that uh, some scientists have made is that there exists something called Nemesis, the Death Star. And what this is, is it's a binary star that's a companion to the Sun. And when these two stars get close together, the gravitational attraction of this nearby star affects the different objects that are in the sky and causes more impacts to occur on Earth. And when Earth is far away from uh, the, the Nemesis star, uh, those things are not happening. Is this claim correct? Well, in order to figure that out, we're going to need to understand a lot more about how gravity works and how it could impact this whole system. That means we're ready to transition into instructional segment two.